it's on. Awesome. Well, welcome, everybody, and thanks to all my panelists for being here. As Ken mentioned, I'm Stephanie Pedroza, Senior Marketing Manager and Capital Program Specialist at Orgo Software Technologies. And thank you all for staying this late. I know it has been a very, very long day, so thank you so much for staying in this panel. And I'm honored to be here with industry leaders in California who are going to be talking about a topic that's really important for capital program delivery. Um, so a little bit about Orgo Software, we've been happy, helping capital owners manage their infrastructure programs for about two decades. And the issue of gaining accurate public feedback comes up pretty frequently. So that's why we're here, because these agencies are going to share how they gain public feedback to deliver modern infrastructure. So if you'd like to learn more about Orgo, you can visit us online at www.aurigo.com. So I'll get started with the panel. I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves. So I'll start with you, Jim. Uh, Jim Appleby, I'm the Director of Operations for Anaheim Transportation Network. And I'm Raha Azarmeh, I'm the Program Manager for Sound Installation Program, Los Angeles World Airport. Alyssa Silhai, I'm a Council Member for the City of Lincoln. We are about 25 miles northeast um, from Sacramento at the base of the Sierra Foothills. Good evening, I'm Sarah Iza, I'm the Land Development Manager at Santa Barbara Airport. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining me. And the first question that I'm asking, um, how has public feedback influenced your agency's current projects? So I'll start with you, Jim, and then we'll go down the line, and you guys can share how public feedback has influenced. Yeah. So um, it's actually, public feedback is actually the backbone of our current project, which is called Electrify Anaheim, a project to... Uh, uh, transition our, our fleet of buses to all battery electric and uh, also uh, increase uh, service through microtransit, uh, um, on-demand uh, transit, so some unique delivery methods, and then also the infrastructure for those uh, buses, for uh, the, uh, the charging infrastructure. And really, uh, you look at Anaheim, and uh, it's a city where tourism is a big part uh, of that city. Uh, it's a city with 350,000 residents, uh, 24,000 businesses, and 25 million visitors annually. So that, you know, that, that crash of competing interests, um, you know, residents really have a, do give a lot of feedback about uh, traffic congestion and uh, uh, air pollution. Uh, and um, and so the Electrify Anaheim project really was born out of that feedback of how do we move all these people with their competing interests for uh, residents and commuters and all the visitors to the area uh, and uh, do it in an efficient way to, to solve a lot of those problems for them. All right, and we'll go with... And Anna. of course, uh, the Los Angeles World Airport, LAX, is the fifth busiest airport in the world. So there are a lot of airplanes, a lot of noise. So the whole sound mitigation program, sound installation program was born uh, to mitigate the noise and because the feedback that we got from the community. The program started in 1997. It's the largest sound installation program in the country. Uh, the spending so far has been $1.68 billion, uh, adding doors, double pane windows, sound insulating doors, and AC to the homes, over 21,000 homes around the community. Um, we basically completed the City of Los Angeles program. We're working with different jurisdictions, City of LA, County of LA, uh, City of El Segundo, and uh, City of Inglewood. So basically we completed City of LA program, but uh, due, to, uh, due to the feedback that we got from the community, we are reopening that program again for the homeowners that didn't participate. So the whole program has been developed based on the feedback that we got from the community. It is a program by the people, for the people, and uh, we are basically working and we're getting feedback on a constant basis from the community to give them what they like and what they want from us. So the project that comes to mind for me, it's maybe a little bit of a different tale on it. So we're a full service city and we have a wastewater reclamation facility. We're about 1,200 EDUs, equivalent dwelling units, um, over capacity. And we have um, the county, uh, we, we service a portion of their unincorporated area uh, two communities away. Um, they weren't agreeing with us on some of the financials and we have to expand the plant and we needed to get that settled to be able to do the rate study. Um, and so we brought the public into the process because 
as it currently stands, we're gonna continue to build out. We have development in the process and we would end up in a really big issue with a wastewater treatment facility that doesn't have capacity to service our community's needs. So we reached out to the community to explain to them Here's the situation, we reached out to stakeholders, to developers to explain to them, here's what's going on, here's what we need, and we actually leveraged that in, discuss in discussions with the county to be able to come to an agreement, and the result of it was not where we initially thought that we would land, and instead we've now, um, we're deep in negotiations to form a JPA, um, with the county, all of those are public meetings, they're full-on workshops, the public is engaged and involved in that, and um, we have the trust of stakeholders and the public in transitioning the liability and the debt and everything that we've already bought in and provided for into a different um, government form because of the public stakeholder process that happened on the forefront. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if Beverly Hills is still here, um, but we're very similar to Beverly Hills, about the same size. Um, we have a very small airport, though. Um, I'm relatively new to the airport, so I'm going to speak about another public works project. Um, I've worked in streets, bridges, um, other critical infrastructure. Um, one project that I learned a lot about, it's our largest CIP project to date, it's the police station project. Um, our existing police station was built in 1957. It's seism seismically unfit and way too small for our, our force. Um, so we have a project funded by Measure C, which is a sales tax that was passed in 2017, that we began planning for a new police station in 2018. Um, and that began with our police chief asking us, the, the project planning team and engineering team, um, to reach out to the community um, through community organizers. Um, so we, we found specific community organizers on either side of State Street, which is the main street um, that goes through our central business district, that are also um, our two mi majority minority districts in the city. Um, so we reached out to those communities, which are also 95% um, Spanish-speaking um, of people that speak only um, a, a, a language other than English. Um, so that said, we reached out to those communities. Everything that we do is um, dual language, Spanish translation, um, both in writing and um, written uh, and spoken as well. Um, we held several community outreach meetings um, and received really good feedback. And one of the, the special gems from that feedback was that the community wanted a community space in the new police station. Um, and you may ask, what would a community space be in a police station? But one thing that was, that was wanted was a special area where people could exchange goods and services in a safe space, um, which none of us had thought of. Um, so it's a little area. It's only in concept design still, but... Um, that's just one example. And so moving forward, um, we're taking those lessons for all of our CIP projects is to really begin, get ahead, um, tell the community why we're doing it and ask for their feedback and try to incorporate um, their request into the design. Awesome, thank you. And I like the points that you said, you know, it's, you build projects for your community and we all know it, community engagement is the backbone of everyone's capital delivery. And, each of these agencies really talked on that, how they need their community just to go with any of these projects. So my next question is, what has been the greatest challenge your agency has faced when gaining public participation? Because we all know gaining public participation is crucial, but also extremely difficult. So um, Rahul, I don't know if you wanna take on that question. Uh, sure, with the airport, um, the first thing that comes in mind when you, seek public feedback is complaints. It's complaint about congestion, complaint about air quality, complaint about noise, complaint about traffic. I mean, it, it is all complaints. So it is very difficult to really concentrate on, on a positive point of public feedback. And okay, hold on, let's go step by step, let's break it in pieces, let's focus on a single point of view. Uh, but when an airport takes on $16 billion of construction, I know each of you probably have gone through the airport, that construction that backs up traffic so bad that you see people walking through 105 freeway with their suitcases just to make their planes. It's not really easy to focus on the, on the positive side of it. But with sound insulation, we have been able to find positive views, especially as 
the, you know, when the project starts rolling and you see with homes and you see with the schools, especially with the schools, we've seen the community coming together, seeing the renovated schools, seeing uh, basically how we rebuilt the school from ground up, uh, the school buildings in hardly hit areas of the city like Inglewood and Lenox, that when you open up the walls to change the windows, you see that termite damage has run down the building. Uh, so bad that a couple of the beams on the ceiling were broken. They had to basically uh, put poles up, evacuate the building, and we were lucky that we got it. If not, it would have come down on children's heads. So when you have stories like that, and when you start building the positives and people see the positive outcome of it, when there is a light at the end of the tunnel that, okay, we are building a people mover that's going to reduce the congestion, that's when you start gaining the trust of people. But in the beginning, it's difficult. Yeah, and I know, um, Jim, you were also mentioning that you have some, you know, challenges when getting public feedback as well. So I don't know if you want to share that. Yeah, ours uh, seemed to be about the perception about what we were doing. You know, we, like I said, that we were, we were really going after meeting the needs from public feedback by moving to uh, battery electric buses, uh, changing over that fleet, but then there's the infrastructure that goes with that. And you know, when you look at where were we going to build this charging infrastructure, and you start to talk to people, and the perception of a bus yard just isn't the same thing as to what we're actually building. Uh, you know, we're building state of the art. We're building electric charging infrastructure. There's not engines. There's not. You know, you think of the bus, you think of a stinky bus and diesel fumes and, you know, so getting the, the mindset of people as you're talking about it to be, to be the reality of what you're actually building was kind of a challenge for us uh, and, and overcoming that because the very first thing anybody ever thinks of is just the negatives about it. And so um, I'm not going to say we, we did a great job because we actually didn't. Uh, it, you know, that was the, the feedback we got was very negative because we didn't go out there and give them a really good description of what we were doing uh, and, um, uh, and, and do that in the beginning. For us, um, it kind of goes back to that old adage, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? Um, right, we have all these good ideas, or there are ideas that we think are good. Um, but then it's how do you get it to the right target audience? We have QR codes, we have online surveys, we have GIS tools, mapping tools, all of our projects listed online. Um, but we also have 38% senior citizen, we have about 50% working families, we have 22% Latino population, um, a lot of them are not trusting of, of government. Um, and so how do we access those populations. And so all of the cool technology tools don't necessarily play really well for my 90-year-old, you know, seniors playing golf versus am I saying the right things or phrasing it in the right way or am I delivering it with the right messenger into my Latino community. And so um, one of the things I think that we're doing right with that, though, is partnering outside of government. It's for that population, it's maybe messaging through the school system. They have their trust or trying to find out different venues and avenues to do it. And that is, I think, the biggest challenge is making sure what we're doing is playing to the audience so we're actually soliciting the feedback from the individuals that we're looking for. I would agree with that, yes. Um, we found that posting information at laundromats, grocery stores, schools, community rooms uh, is very critical. People actually see that information there. Um, also, we do post online, and we always have a personal email address um, for project every single project that we have. Um, so somebody will get back to you within 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, and that's something that gaining the public's trust is very important. And we hosted a webinar at the beginning of the year with the ASHA president of Louisiana Department of Transportation. And one thing that you mentioned, you need to send, so if you're talking to like a Latino community, um, in Louisiana they have a big Afro-American community, you need to send somebody that looks like them because that's how you're gonna gain trust from your, from your public. So if you send somebody who speaks the language, who looks like your audience, they're more susceptible to actually giving public feedback. So that was like a, a takeaway that I took from my panel earlier on. 
So next questions. Um, what strategies have you found successful when gaining public feedback? And I'll start with you, Alyssa, because you had mentioned some strategies. So yeah, going back to, like I said, I, we have ideas that we think are good ideas. We're a population of about 50,000. They might not be novel, but they're novel for our community. And um, one thing that really changed the game during COVID was we were trying to figure out how do we access our public? Everything is shut down. And it really changed the way that we think about what we're doing. And so what we are doing now, particularly in our parks, normally the way that a park is developed is the developer comes with the idea of what they want for the community. They present their plans, it goes to the planning committee, and it just kind of is almost like a, oh yeah, that looks great, it's a pretty park, here's the, you know, land use things, and here's a playground, and okay. And we said, no, we now have QR codes for any park that's in development, and we're making sure that they're being delivered by different methods. We're posting them on our Facebook page, we're posting them. We're asking our police department, in our community, our community really values our police department. They have the highest following of any of the city pages. And so we've asked them to repost important community posts to get the information out to the public because they're seeing it that way. Same with the school district. Um, and we're asking the communities that those parks are being built in, what do you wanna see? Rank it. Tell me what's most important to you, because particularly with the current construction climate and how expensive everything is right now, um, the park that we planned maybe you know five years ago is not going to be able to be paid for in full by the time that it comes to fruition. And so now we're having a ranked list from the community using those facilities and using those parks so we know what to cut first. And that, I think, never would have happened in our community absent COVID. And we also have, like I mentioned, we have GIS links of every project. We have mapping tools online. We have a register of every single project that's happening, the status, the contact, and are trying to post it and put it public. Um, any site that's approved, we have the information there. So if someone's driving by and they're like, hey, what it, what's being built in my neighborhood? They have that information accessible to them. They could take a picture of it, call when they get home and find out what's happening. I agree. Yeah. So um, during COVID, we weren't able to do public charrettes anymore. Uh, but one thing that we were able to do and, and advanced a lot was um, survey the public and various different methods. And that was very successful. Um, so for instance, um, we're redesigning Daily Guerra Plaza, which is right outside of City Hall. Some of you may know, but it's, it's pretty run down um, and it's a city priority to redesign it. Um, and we've, we've received you know, hundreds, thousands of comments, uh, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds and thousands. Um, of comments on, on the design, and we're working our way through it through our boards and commissions and, um, and our community. And I can also add that during COVID, we have a noise roundtable that takes the input from the community on a quarterly basis. So uh, we had to take the uh, noise roundtable that was local in person, take it online. So the, the whole portal has gone, has gone online. And then we also uh, developed a, a noise portal. And it's very cool. If you haven't seen it, you can search it. So it, it gives you the flight information, uh, the actual airlines that are moving. If you click on it, it tells you which airline was moving where, and it gives you GIS direction and a map of where the airline was moving. Uh, the amount of noise that it was creating, it gives all the information, flight number, uh, the, the timing, everything. So we were able to come up with that portal that gives uh, on-time information to the community. So if everybody, if anybody calls and or make a complaint that, oh, I, ha I hear airplane noise or I have this issue. We can track it exactly at the time and where the airport, where the airline was in the air exactly at that time. What airline was it? And then um, that's how we started communicating with the community, with the online portals, with the online community. And um, everybody has responded pretty well. We have the whole community with us now, and not only the community around the airport. Now we hear from people uh, outside of the airport, anywhere from Woodland Hills, Calabasas, all the way to Palos Verdes. You think they don't hear the airplane noise, but they do. And when they have a complaint, for sure they know how to reach us. So, <laughs> yes, that's how we engage the community. So we've been able to capitalize on some unique relationships that were actually built through COVID. Uh, so, you know, when, uh, when things were really slowing down, obviously tourism was really low, our routes were running empty buses. And so as we looked at ways that we could help in the community, and obviously we did things like delivered PPE and partnered with different organizations, but then there were also some unique things that came up uh, in some of the, 
uh, affordable housing complexes, uh, taking our bus over there with the Wi-Fi to give students the ability to use Wi-Fi off the bus. Uh, also, food delivery, because there were a bunch of students that, you know, school was the only good meal they were getting every day. And so, partnering, uh, we partnered with the YMCA, uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, uh, the uh, Community Action Partnership, Orange County, and the Family Justice Center. So, these were all organizations that we began to build relationships with because they had needs and we had the opportunity to help them through this period. And then as we were coming out of it, we realized these were some great relationships that we now had where we can now reach out to their constituents with a new, we had a new transportation survey that we were putting out. So we reached out to all of those organizations that we had built these relationships with and said, we'd like to reach out to some underserved communities, not just you know the five people that show up to every meeting, but uh, also to these underserved communities, they've been a great partner and coming up with some fantastic ways, because we, we didn't know, even know how, so, like, so we would ask the question, so, so what's the best way to reach out? You know, is, it, is it going to be through an online survey or a QR code, or do we have to show up at your food distribution with an iPad and have them take the survey? Uh, so great feedback that we got from them with um, lots of good suggestions on how to reach out to people and then you know, also ask them, well, who else should we be reaching out to? And they all had great answers. And so they were, you know, it was partly because we had built some good relationships through that unique experience, but also they were organizations that were really happy to, to help, uh, not only help you reach their people, but also other organizations that they were aware of. Can I just double down on that? Because I think that what you just said is the most important lesson I've learned since I've been on council. And I think that when it comes to public engagement, partnerships really is what makes that the difference. Um, we've relied now on nonprofits, on um, you know our whether it's homelessness issues and the infrastructure, the natural infrastructure or critical infrastructure projects, it's the school district to access certain populations, it's nonprofits for some, it's the chamber for others, it's the developers group for some, it's PTO. So I've literally gone and, and like posted things and talked to each PTO president because that's where moms are, right? That's where like you get information to normal households. And um, those partnerships to create a sense of community to your point, I think really make the difference. Yeah, no, and I like to hear that, and that's gonna transition into my next question. How can we ensure more equitable participation? So I think that was probably a positive from COVID is instead of hosting town hall meetings where only certain neighborhoods can actually attend, we're opening it to social media, we're opening it to online, where now you get more equitable participation. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, Sarah, I don't know if you can kind of tap on that since you were sure. talking about the Latino community, but how can we ensure more equitable participation? I'd like to not talk about COVID. <laughs> so we're, we're over it and now we're back to all in person um, and I'm so grateful because we have better participation in person. Um, one thing, or a few things that we found are successful are uh, providing childcare um, at all of our public workshops. We try to host them in the evening or on Saturdays, not on soccer Saturdays, or after games are over. Um, we also provide food, um, and we budget that in at the beginning of our project. Um, people won't come if there's not food. Um, we provide, the, along with the childcare, um, toys for kids to play with. So we have a box of toys that we just take to every meeting. We disinfect them when we're done. And um, we find that's really successful, and people appreciate that. They will attend if, if those things are provided. So. Um, for us, it is uh, the lesson learned from COVID, I think, will stick with us. Going back to the nature of my population, though, right? We have 38% who are senior citizens, some of them very senior citizen, but they're very engaged and very active. So we're keeping a hybrid for everything. Our council member, our, our council meetings went back in person a while ago, but we keep a hybrid and we're going to in perpetuity. Same for our boards, our commissions, um, our town halls, so that we can try to have something for everyone. And I think that that was a lesson learned. It's, you know, it, it might be, I like your idea, I already, I already told her I'm, I'm stealing the community um, room idea. I already talked to my city manager. <laughs> it's a really great idea. As one way to try and um, access a, a community's voice that I hadn't considered in that way before. Um, but yeah, I think that it's, it's multimodal. Yes, and for sound insulation program, we go door to door. With homeowner liaison, we knock on every single door. 
And we send somebody who, as you said, looks like the people inside the house, speak the same language as people inside the house. So we make sure that we have the right tools, the right message, the right messenger, and we do it more than once. We communicate the message. We communicate the benefits of the program because it's a voluntary program. Overall in the country, there is 80% participation. Our city of LA program had 89% participation and they're coming back for more. So uh, that knocking on every single door, yes, it costs us. It is, uh, finan it, it, it is a financial burden, I can tell. But what we get back from it, the connection that we have with the community, uh, it's really worth uh, what we pay for it. Yeah, I, I like how you said multimodal. As a, as a transportation guy, that's kind of you know, one of the things that I've worked with for some time is delivering trans in, in delivering multi modes of transportation, but also, you know, for reaching out with a survey uh, to to people, being the ability to think about different ways to deliver that. Uh, one of the groups that we had tried to reach um, uh, uh, it was the senior community in our downtown area, and we knew where the you know the senior center was. We knew where the um, uh, uh, assisted living center was. Um, but, um, you know, they're not necessarily going to get that QR code or, the, and so we actually went and said, well, how do, you know, what's the best way we're going to be able to reach out to them? And they said, you know, well, you, you mail them a paper survey to their house. Yep. I'm just like, okay, well, so, so it's, you know, the idea of, okay, there's going to be a multiple ways that we're going to, uh, reach out to people, uh, in, in order to, in, in order to reach that, that, that equitable, uh, solution that we're trying to get. Yeah, it can't be a one-size-fits-all approach. And I guess, like, being a marketing manager, it's like, target your market. How are you going to reach your certain market, and how are you going to deliver that message is really, really important, especially with public engagement. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left. What can agencies do now? So what advice can you give agencies? What can they do now to gain more public participation from their constituents now with the infrastructure bill coming around and public engagement being a huge component of it, what advice do you give everyone here to get better public participation? So for every RFQ or RFP that we're putting out, we put in a special item for public outreach and engagement. Um, we want that covered, just no problems, no questions asked. And we always try to answer the why at the beginning of the project um, for everybody. We remind ourselves, this came from our council's strategic plan. Um, why are we doing this? Talk about the purpose. And then our overall mission is to build the public trust and high regard. And so if we ever feel that we're not meeting that, we need to go back to that and, and remind ourselves why we're doing it. So and to build on that, at the policy setting level, before the project comes to inception, um, and we started doing this when you know, we got the CARES Act funding and then we got the ARPA funds, and then there should be infrastructure funding that trickles down through the state to be able to help with projects for grants and whatnot. We've started talking about it. We, we do workshops, again, surveys, all of the different methods of delivery that we talked about to try to educate the public. These funds are maybe available. Um, Here's what we would like. What projects would you like? Here's what could be coming to our community so that we can get an idea first of what, if we get some of those funds, which prioritizations should be funded first so that then when an RFP or something goes out, it can continue. So it's that, you know, pre-project, pre during project, post-project, trying to figure out how are we going to communicate all the way through to make it successful. And uh, for us, being transparent about everything, about the benefits of a program and also limitations that we have in mitigating uh, either the construction noise, airplane noise, uh, the pollution, air quality, and where LAX, LAWA, or the city is a standing uh, with legal jurisdiction. So, for example, F the FAA has jurisdiction over uh, the whole operation of the airport. So a lot of our funding uh, that has to go through rules and regulations of the FAA. So there are limits. Uh, some people have difficulty understanding, oh, your airport with a lot of money, so how come my home cannot get fixed? So that's the point that we get into the FAA regulations, that there is a limit for it. And also, uh, it, it, even I know if we still have our county uh, friends here, we had a discussion with 
like the Supervisor Mitchell's office. Uh, they didn't have a total understanding of where we stand in terms of our jurisdictions and ability to help people. So explaining the whole process and the whole regulation behind it, the whys, the benefits, and also the limitations makes everybody a lot more comfortable. And sometimes if we don't have the solution, the, the congressional person, the representative, can be your next go-to person. So at this point, if I cannot solve your problem, contact your congress congressional representative. Maybe they would put pressure on FAA to solve the, the solution. And we have been able to get results. For example, with uh, Inglewood Unified School District, uh, the FAA didn't approve funding to uh, sound insulate the Inglewood High School, which is the largest school in the district. I mean, they had their own reasoning that the noise contour went in the middle of the campus, and half of it was in the counter, and half of it wasn't, so half of it was eligible for funding, and half of it wasn't, so it just didn't make sense. But there was nothing we could do about it. So uh, when the, uh, basically, a school super, the, the IUSD superintendent called me, I was like, what do you mean? I was like, look, there is nothing I can do about it anymore. We can send a letter to FAA, but at this point, you need to call Maxine Waters. And believe it or not, they got the funding in a matter of days. So sometimes explaining the process and the limitations will open the doors for finding the solutions that we can all come together and get what the community deserves and give the community what, what it should be delivered to them. From a, from a lessons learned standpoint, I'd say you know, for letting people know what's in it for them, to be a part of the process, you know, to have, give them a good understanding of, you know, you're, you're participating in this because it's going to be a benefit to you and to your neighbors. And, um, you know, to not communicate with wonky kind of language, which I think we're very guilty of uh, in transportation sometimes. Awesome. So my last question is, because a lot of you talked on it, how can agencies better communicate the purpose of the project more efficiently to their constituents? So I'll hand that over um, to Jim over here, because you had mentioned at first you weren't successful. So how can you better communicate? And I think also, Alyssa, you had said, like, sometimes you can't communicate straight. Like, how do you get the right message towards your constituents? So what do you have to say for that? Yeah, so I yeah, could kind of mention that the, the failure of really communicating well to people um, what our uh, charging facility was going to be, not just a, a bus yard or a maintenance facility for buses and all the images of that conjures in people's mind, um, but to, uh, like I said, to, to give them the, the, help them understand that this is gonna be a benefit to you and to give them good information about what you're uh, talking about, and um, you know, for for where we were going to put the, uh, the the charging facility, it it was very difficult. There was a lot of pushback from everywhere we were trying to do it, and um, even even for future development, it was nothing there. But there's going to be future development, and so the developer doesn't even want us there because he doesn't want to <laughs> try to sell his units uh, next to our bus yard. Um, but then also the maintenance facility was a separate facility, and uh, for that one, we, we actually did go, and I think somebody mentioned door to door, um, and uh, talk to, that, that, now that's in a more uh, industrial area, so it's, it's almost like the land of misfit toys. There's a, you know, a tow yard, a pest control place, and a vape shop, and so uh, a little easier to talk to those folks. We're actually beautifying that area, but... Um, but uh, I think that education of, uh, and good, clear messaging of, uh, uh, of what is actually happening and be, being built. I think the answer is simple. It's the execution that is difficult, right? The devil's in the details. And I actually think that Raha said it best when you said it's the right tools with the right message, with the right messenger, and I'd add delivered in the right way at the right time. To your point of not during suckers. I can never go to anything during Saturday mornings. That's baseball, <laughs> right? <laughs> Friday night's football. Um, and so I, we don't always get it right. And it is a constant learning process of, do I have the right messenger? 
do I have the right message? Is it the right time? And constantly checking yourself and trying to utilize your partnerships, utilize resources for us in the community that might not cost you anything because money is always an issue to try to leverage everything that you have to be able to, you know, force multiply that message to try to, to strike the right tone. Yes, and uh, go ahead, please. So uh, for us, basically, it comes down to holding people's hands. So after going door to door, you know, write tools and all that, so now it comes delivery time. So you have to basically hold the person's hand and say, look, we are going to come to your house. It's going to take us three days. We're taking your windows out. We're going to put new ones in, and we're going to add an AC on the top, and we're going to get out of here and leave your house as clean as we can, the way we came in. And delivering on that, to your point, uh, is not always easy. So in the meantime, it's not only the messaging to the homeowner and to the community, because if we leave one home dirty, if we mismanage one project, the word of mouth is going to go through the whole community. So dealing with contractors, with the construction crew, uh, we have a whole... Uh, training for our construction crew, how to deal with homeowners, how to be appropriate, how to use the right language, as you said, and how to be polite and leave everything clean. So we have one person that basically goes to door, door to door and checks to make sure that everything was done right and properly, because one wrong step is going to ruin our reputation with the whole community. So that delivery, as you said, is very, very important. I think that goes back to your um, transparency and trustworthiness, right? If you're going to gain the trust of a community, then you better keep it. And I'd just like to add... Oh, so, thank you. I'd just like to add that um, we'd like to demonstrate that we're listening. So um, back to the original intent of a project. If, if an element is really creating a lot of strife, some, it may need to just come out as long as you're accomplishing the original goal of the project. And we like to be able to negotiate and collaborate with the public on, on certain items. And sometimes we just have to let things go and things change and that's how it is. Can I just say I'm so glad you brought that up because none of us talked about that, right? Part of the public outreach process is actually hearing the messages that say they send back to you and then changing your approach. Oh, hey, that actually doesn't work for my community. Didn't think of it that way. Okay, we'll let that go. Tell me what does work. Yeah, and I think a big part of that is maintaining that communication not only at the beginning but also during the project after the project, it's gaining, like keeping that communication line going because that's how you're gonna maintain trust for your community. So one of the things, just real quickly, one of the things we do, back to parks because that's a big, that's a big part of, of cities, right, of communities. If you have good parks, you have good schools. If you have good schools, you have good economic development. If you have good economic development, you have safe cities. It's kind of like, really like the foundational building block. Um, but we do a post survey for all of our, our major projects to try and find out what do we get wrong? And we try and build that into next time. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is, like you said, you're never going to get it right. It's always a trial and error, but just maintain communication, be transparent, and gain everyone's trust. Um, so now we have a couple of minutes left. I'm leaving it open for questions. I don't know if anyone has questions for any of the panelists. They're ready for drinks. Yeah, everyone's ready. It's been a long day. Oh, oh one, yeah. one question over here. Hi. Uh, Alyssa, you mentioned that you guys have gone to a full hybrid uh, comments, and I'm wondering how that was. How, have you had to hire a bunch of extra people? Is there better software available than my people are telling me? So let me get your information after, and I will find out. We have the most amazing city clerk ever, so she might be the answer. And we also have a really great IT um, manager who is, her official title is, I believe, Director of Innovation. Um, and they figured it out. And so we are in person, and we are live streaming on YouTube, but they also can call in and at the phone, or they can participate via Zoom all at the same time, and that's for all of our meetings that are held in chambers, and so we're holding more meetings in chambers for different boards and commissions so that that capability can happen, and I believe are procuring um, equipment so that that can also happen in a community room um, for workshops and things like that, and we figured it out about a year ago. It's a, there's been feedback, there's been some hiccups, but it works really well, and our community loves it. 
And it has really opened up. We actually, you said you have less participation. I think from our demographic, we have more participation. We're, we're experiencing more participation because people aren't having to leave their home to come and give a comment. They're just watching and they call in when it's something they care about. But I'll get you the information. Any other questions? Everyone's ready for a drink right, right about now, right? <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, and thank you for our panelists, and you guys have a good rest of the night.